Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We appreciate our visitors. We're glad you're here. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. And if you get on your phone and call a friend and have them to tune in and get this hour, I do believe we can be a blessing to them. Now, take your Bible, will you please, and turn to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, the second book in the uh, Old Testament, chapter 2. Now, this tape is tape number 224. We'll send this tape to you for a gift of $3. The gift is used to help defray our radio expense. Tape number 224, I'm speaking on the man and wife that had to hide their son or hid their son for three months. Exodus chapter 2, I'll begin reading in just a moment with verse 1. I want you to turn there quickly and follow me in the word of God. You'll be here this evening at 6 o'clock if you enjoyed the good singing and music this morning. You'll hear much more this evening. we have more time in the evening service for good singers. we have a lot of special singers here. You'll be hearing from them and the musicians. And then we'll be bringing you the message. Come at six and be with us if you can. The book of Exodus chapter two. There went out a man of the house of Levi and took to a wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him for an ark of bulrush, took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh, Unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now, notice verse 22 of chapter 1. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, you shall cast him into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Now you can see then why that Moses, or why Moses' father and mother hid him three months. Because Pharaoh said, I want every male child put to death that's born here in the land of Egypt. But they saw he was a goodly child, and they said, we want to keep him, and they hid him as long as they could. And then after they could hide him no longer, they put him in a little ark and sit him down in the bulrushes there in the water at the river Nile. I have been there, I have seen this place with my own eyes more than one time. And it's a place where whenever you see it, you think about what happened there that day when that little babe was placed there, alone as it wept, and then what took place. Now a period of time had elapsed since the time of Joseph. Joseph came down into Egypt, brought his parents, and there his brothers, of course, and their loved ones. But time had moved on, and the pharaohs had died, and now there was a new king that knew not Joseph. He may have been a king that had come in and conquered Egypt during this period of time. But many years had gone by. And so he says, now we can't have these Israelites uh, giving birth to children, to male children, because they'll get, become so strong that they'll overthrow our government and take over. Must, something must be done. So the old king, the old pharaoh, issued forth a decree that every male child must be put to death. Now you can imagine how they felt and what they did in a time like this. So first of all, we notice that order of the king. 
In chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew wives, midwives, and he said, When you do the sacrifice of a midwife to the Hebrew women, Hebrew families, he was afraid of what might happen in the future. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, And Pharaoh charged all of his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Now, can you imagine how those mothers felt when multitudes of them had to give up their little male sons and see them cast into the Nile River. But here comes a little child that was a goodly child, and there he was spared for a reason. Moses' parents, that is Amram and Joseph, had refused to be intimidated by the king. When this little boy was born in their home, the Bible said they saw he was a goodly child, a precious child, and God no doubt had already spoken to them and insisted that they spare this child, so they hid him three months. They feared God more than man. They said, we know the king said they must die, but we fear God more than man, and we're going to spare this child. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. They believed that they could keep this child, that he would remain alive, because he was different. He was a goodly child, and the hand of God was upon him. We find in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, Peter said, and the apostles answered, said, we ought to obey God rather than man. You may say, preach Edwards, does the Bible say to obey the powers that be? Yes, as long as the powers that be doesn't command you to do something contrary to the word of God, or try to keep you from doing what God said in his wonderful book. Now, whenever God said it, that's it. That's above any power on the face of the earth. And they feared God. They said God's able to keep this child alive. And so God did. We find another case in the book of Daniel among the three Hebrew children. Whenever they commanded them that they would bow down and worship an image, they refused to do so. And there they were thrown into the fiery furnace. They obeyed God rather than man. They said, we're not going we're not going to bow down and worship this idol, and they did not. They would not bow down to the image, and they stood true. And when they stood true to God, then, of course, Jesus Christ came down from heaven and walked in the midst of the fire with them, and there was no harm that came to them because they obeyed God rather than man. Now, we find that Amram and Joseph had here obeyed God rather than man. They said, we're not going to listen to Pharaoh. Our little boy will not be put to death. By faith, we're going to keep him alive, and they did. We find by faith they hid that child for three months. The Bible tells us here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. Now, this was the faith of their parents. Now, parents need to have faith for their children. You that's rearing children today, you need faith. I mean much faith in rearing those children. Our young people are facing today many temptations and many things that we did not face when I was a boy, a junior, or an immediate teenager growing up. Our young people, they need our prayers, and they need our faith. Faith that God will protect them and be with them, because as much facing them today like we never faced when I was a little boy. Now, Paul's word came to young Timothy on one occasion. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 5, When I call to remember the unfaith faith is in thee, which dwells first with thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I'm persuaded in thee also. Now when a mother and dad has much faith in God, some of that is bound to rub off on the children. That's what Paul said to young Timothy. That faith is in your grandmother, and in your mother, I'm sure, is in you also. Then number four, they saw he was a proper child in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23 because they saw he was a proper child. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 20, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair. Now, this little babe was unusual. He was exceeding fair. He was a proper child. And we see here that they said we're going to spare him because we have faith enough to believe that he will serve God and God will take care of him. And they prayed to that and they believed that and prayed to that end. Last week, my heart was greatly touched. When there's a van pulled up in our yard and a lady came to the door and she said, Preach Edwards, we have a little boy out here in the van 
and said he listens to you every day. He's an invalid. He's been that way for 17 years. He was only about the size of a two or three year old boy. And they had him in his little bed there in the van. And she said, Preach Edwards, when you come on the radio, said he'd throw up his little hands and he'll begin to make joyful noise and he'll listen and it just thrills him to hear your voice on the radio. And she said, Preach Edwards, I've driven here to bring this boy because I want him to hear your voice in person. I want him to see you. I went out to that van. There lay that little child, only about the size of a two and a half year old boy. And I walked up to him and called him by name. They told me his name. And I began to talk to him. He began to grin and wall his eyes and began to throw up his little hands. And, and I thought, my, how much this grandmother must love this boy to take him and keep him. Now he's 17 years old. And she said, oh, preacher Edwards, said he's such a precious child. He's such a blessing to us. As I stood there, my heart was strangely moved. As I watched that little fella, an invalid now for 17 years, couldn't walk, couldn't sit up, lying there in his little bed, there in the van. He just wanted to hear Preach Edwards' voice. He wanted to see me. And there I talked with him, and, and there it thrilled him so much as I came into his presence personally because my voice had been heard so many times through medium of radio. You never know when you uh, get on the radio program, a station, a mic, get behind the mic, where your voice will be going and what it'll be doing. People that support this ministry don't realize what an opportunity they have to help get out the gospel and be a blessing to people in every walks of life. And I thought about that mother, or that grandmother, how she cared for that little boy now for 17 years. Then I thought about that couple down in Atlanta, had that little child that hadn't fed him in four weeks. And he's just about to starve to death. If you saw the news this past week, you saw that. And the dad said he thought the mother was feeding the child. And the mother said she thought the dad was feeding the child. In fact, they both knew they were going to let the little fella die. Many people today would like to have a precious little child in their arms, in their homes. Now think about this grandmother caring for this little one for 17 years. I saw the news last week where a woman in New York that works in the hospital Whenever a little child is born that's deformed, um, a mentally unbalanced, she tries to find that child a home. And she doesn't stop until she finds a home for that little retarded child and places it in the arms of somebody that loves it. How could a mother and dad starve their child to death? How could they abuse their child in that manner? It has to be demonism. Now we find that this man and woman, the father and mother of Moses said, No, sir, my baby will never go be placed in the river Nile and put to death. No, sir, the crocodiles will not eat my child. We believe God. God's going to take care of him. And they obeyed God rather than man. I'll never forget it. longest day that I live. I was at a meeting in Oliver Springs, Tennessee, just out of Knoxville. One morning the pastor said, Brother Edwards, I want you to go with me. We have something to do that I'd like for you to be with me. I said, yes, preacher. I'll gladly go. I was with him in the meeting and the evangelist, and I wanted to do all I could. And he said, get in the station wagon, we'll go. We got in the station wagon, we drove to this home, and we got out. He said, Preacher Edwards, you're going to face something now that's very sad. He said, in this home here is a young mother, and she has three precious children. They were about the ages, maybe about six, four and two, something like that. And he said, their dad is in prison, in jail. He'll be sent to prison. And said, this mother said she didn't want these children. Her home's in Indiana. And she wanted to go back home and live it up. And she did not want the responsibility of these three little children. And he said they loved their mother and they loved their dad. And preach Edwards, this is not going to be easy. He said soon they'll be here from Orphanage home to take these three children away. And then the mother has to sign them away that they had to remain in that Orphanage home until they pass 18 years of age. I walked in, my heart was touched. There sit that mother. She was under 30 years old, maybe in her late 20s. There were three precious little children. And then there pulled up in the yard a station wagon. There came in a man and woman from the orphanage home. They came to pick them up. And when they told them what they were going to do, those little children began to scream. They began to cry. They began to say, Mama, Mama, we love you. Mama, please, Mama, don't send us away. And they held up our hand. And they held her by a dress. And the reason around the arms around her. And they all three wept. 
and say, Mama, we love you, Mama. Let us stay with you. Mama, let us go with you. Don't send us away, Mama. Please don't send us away. And there those people from that orphanage home reached out and literally pulled those babies away from their mother. There wasn't a tear in her eye. She was there as hard as steel. And those little things went out the door, waving their hands, said, Mama, Mama, we love you. Don't let them take us away. I stood there and I wept like a baby. That preacher wept. That was the tear in that mother's eyes. They placed those three children in that station wagon and they went away. You could hear them crying as they pulled out of the driveway and went toward that orphanage home. I doubt very seriously that those children ever saw their mother again. It might be good because of her attitude that they don't. But that was sad. How could she do that? How in the world could that mother do that? Oh, it's demonism. And that's taking place everywhere today, all over this country. Mothers and dads giving away their children, abusing their children, don't care for them, unconcerned about them, and how sad that is. Here we find this couple loved that little boy, and they said, no, sir, no crocodile will put his teeth upon our boy today or any time. We'll hide him and we'll take care of him, and they did. Now they work together. Here we find that this mother and dad pulled together. Now it takes them both to real family. Now you just can't turn your children over to the wife and say, let her do the job. You can't turn the children over to the husband and say, let him do the job. I was reading the other day, I believe yesterday, where a little boy was looking at some pictures, and he was looking at the pictures of his mother and dad when they got married. And he said to his daddy, he said, Daddy, was this picture taken when Mama come to work for us? Now we need to realize that both mother and dad both are to be equal in serving and waiting on their children and loving their children. And here we find they did that. We find in the word of God, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they are praying that God would give them a son. And here comes one of the greatest preachers ever born of woman, old John the Baptist. They believed together. They worked together. They pulled together. And God gave them that fine son. And he became a mighty, mighty Baptist preacher to the glory of God. We find in Acts chapter 18, verse 26, that Aquila and Priscilla heard a preacher preach one day. He was an orator. He was a polis. He's a great speaker. But he was kind of mixed up in the scriptures. He hadn't learned the Bible well. And when they heard him preach, this fine couple that loved God, that was so humble, they called Apollos aside and they said, Apollos, we want to talk to you. You're a great preacher. You're a great orator. You're a great man. We love you. But said, Apollos, there's some things we need to explain to you about the Bible. And he was open-minded. He wasn't a person who said, well, I know it all. Nobody can tell me anything. I have all the answers. You find some people, they like that. They have the answer before you ask the question. They got them all. Nobody can tell them anything. But here we find that Apollos said, yes, yes, I need your help. I need all the advice I can get. I need all the teaching I can get. And here we find Priscilla and Aquila sat down, man and wife, and said, Apollos, this is what this means. And this is what the Bible says here. And this is what God means here. And they helped this great preacher get started in the ministry. And he became a mighty power for God. On the other hand, we find there was a man and woman, both man and wife, who got into deep trouble because together they planned to do something that wasn't right, to lie to the Spirit of God. We find in Acts chapter 5, a man by the name of Ananias and his wife Sapphira. And there they, they said, we're going to sell our land and then carry the money to the church and place it down before the apostles' feet and tell them we brought all of our money we received from our land into the house of God. Now the reason they did that is because of Barnabas had sold his land and brought every penny of it into the house of God and placed it down there at the apostles' feet to be used to take care of God's business. And the people appreciated that. They appreciated Barnabas selling his land and bringing all of his money in. Now, God didn't tell him directly to do that, but he felt like he should. God may not tell you to sell your land or sell your automobile or your home or your funny tour and put it into his business, but if he does, you better do that. And so he sold his land and brought the money in, every penny of it, and placed it there before the apostles to be used in God's work. And announced that the fire had land, and they heard about that. And they said, did you hear what they said about Barnabas? How everybody's bragging on him, uh, what he did, how he gave his money after he sold his land. They said, why don't we get a little of that praise? And the Bible said they agreed together. 
She was privy to what he did. He, he planned it out and she agreed with him to do wrong. And so they sold their land. And the old man Ananias said, Now, Sapphira, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's keep back part of the money. And we'll take part of it down to the church. And we'll tell them, this is the money we received for our land. This is it. We sold our land. We're bringing the money in. And said, we'll keep back part of it. And they won't know the difference down there at the church. And then they'll praise us and pat us on the back and set us on high like they did Barnabas. Old man Ananias said, uh, well, I'll tell you, Sapphira, I'll go first. And he went down to the church and walked down the front with the money. And they brought the money down. And, and Simon Peter looked down at him with those Holy Ghost eyes and said, you sell the land for so much and yea for so much. And Simon Peter said, you have lied to the Holy Ghost. And God struck him dead right there in the church. Simon Peter said, ushers, take this man out and get him ready for the barrel. And he went right on with his message. Three hours later, no doubt he was still preaching. Three hours later came his wife in. She came pressing down the aisle. She said, by this time, they'll be through praising my husband. And they'll set me on high. She walked down, Simon Peter still in the pulpit. He looked at her with those Holy Ghost eyes. He said, did you sell the land for so much? Yea, like your husband, you have lied to the Holy Ghost. God's going to kill you. Bang, she hit the floor. Simon Peter said, Ursus, take her out of here. Get her ready for burial. And he kept on preaching. Now they planned together to lie to God. Simon Peter said, you're not lying to me and you're lying to God. You're lying to the Spirit of God. It's wrong. And there God struck them dead there in the church. See, God knows our hearts. He knows what we have. He knows what we give. He knows what we keep back. Many times God will look at the stub more than he looks at the check. We need to realize that God expects us to be honest and upright in our Christian giving. But they plan to do wrong, plan together to do wrong, and it cost them. Now let's move on in the scriptures. We find that these people pull together to do wrong, whereas the ones we preach about today, they plan together to do right. I'm reminded of the man that organized the Salvation Army, William and Catherine Booth, he and his wife. They worked together to work among the needy in the ghettos yonder in England. The Methodist Church didn't like it because they were working among the poor people in the ghettos. And they called William in one day and they said, William, you're going to have to stop working among those poor, crummy people. We're not going to have anything to do with that. Now you must cease doing that or we're going to uh, turn you out of the church. And uh, they had him up there for this trial so-called. And they said, William, are you going to cease ministering in the ghettos? His little old wife back in the barque stood up. She cupped her hands over her mouth. She said, say, say no, William. Say no. Say no, William. William said, no, I'll not stop working among the ghettos. I'll spend the rest of my days there. And he did. There they pulled together. And what a source of encouragement she was to her husband when time came, when the showdown came, and he had to face the church officials, and there had to make up his mind. Would he cease to serve in the ghettos among the poor, or would he want to remain in the, in the Methodist church? And so he said, I'll work among the poor. We must obey God, and it's good whenever a man has a wife that can stand behind him and say, you do the work of God. You serve the Lord. I'm with you. 100%. And it's wonderful when a wife has a husband. will say, yes, honey, I'll go to church with you today. We'll worship God together. We'll rear our children together. We'll tell them about God. And we'll let them know we both believe in God. We'll buy any husband that has to go to church without his wife. We'll buy any wife that has to go without a husband. We understand these things. And God knows about these things. And God will most certainly reward you for doing so if you have to make that sacrifice. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as under the weaker vessel, as being asked together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now the Bible says, Husband, honor your wife. She's a weaker vessel. Not mentally, of course, but physically he's talking about. She's a weaker vessel physically, and you must honor her and respect that. I'll tell you, a man is low down and sorry as gully dirt. Whenever he beats on his wife and whips her and kicks her around and bangs her around, some big old 250-pound man beating on a 150-pound wife, he ought to be in the chain gang. Beloved, that's not right. A man should never beat on his wife like some cruel, wicked, ungodly men do because God said they are the weaker vessel. He's a coward. Any man, 
any man that's strong and big and jump on his little wife and beat her around, any man that do that is a coward. He's a dirty, low-down coward. He wouldn't jump on somebody his size, but he would jump on a little weak-bodied woman and beat her up. And that's taking place all over the land today, and that's dead wrong. And we find that Simon Peter said, You wives, you men, now you consider your wife the weaker vessel. If you don't, your prayers may be hindered. Did you know if a man and wife gets into a quarrel, and they differ, and they fuss, and they uh, uh, almost fight uh, uh, in the presence of their children, and they come to church calling, and they leave the church calling, there's no need for them to pray. No need for them to pray. God would even answer their prayers until they wouldn't become reconciled to each other and become straightened out that he might hear their prayers. You need to come to church fussing on your wife, expect God to hear your prayer. You shouldn't go home fussing on each other, expect God to hear your prayer. You shouldn't get in a fuss before bedtime and say, now we're going to have prayer and go to bed. You might as well not pray. Husband and wife must agree and be in accord in order to get their prayers answered if they're both saved people. Now, if you have an unsaved husband, then that's a different story. If you have an unsaved wife, that's a different story. And so they took little Moses and put him in the bulrush there in the river. And they looked over him. God did and protected him. Now, notice the results of what happened here and how his faith was honored. There, while he was in the little ark of bulrush there at the river brink, here comes Pharaoh's daughter, a beautiful woman, coming down to the place where she took a bath every day. And she saw that little ark of bulrush. And then she saw in that little ark the cutest little baby she ever laid her eyes on. And she looked a little closer. She saw some little tears like little pearls coming down his little cheeks. Oh, she had a mother's heart. There she saw that little child and she said, how cute. Oh, that's one of the little Hebrew children. Oh, she said, I want it. I want that baby. I don't want that baby to drown. I don't want the crocodiles to eat that baby. I want it. And they're hiding in the bush. This is Moses' sister. See her mother and sent her out there to see what happened. And she stepped out and she said to Pharaoh's daughter, she said, would you like me to go find you a nurse, someone that can take care of that child for you? She said, yes, go find somebody to be a nurse to this child. And she ran and got the child's own mother, Josephette, and, and brought her out and said to Pharaoh's daughter, here is a woman here that will be a nurse to that baby. And uh, she said, fine. And you take the baby and you look after it and care for it. I'll give it the best of education. It'll go liking for nothing. It'll live in Pharaoh's palace. And you'll be a, a good nurse. And I'll put you on a salary. And I'll pay you for taking care of the baby. See how God works here? There she received a salary for caring for her own baby. That was great faith in God. How wonderful it is when people can pull together to the glory of God and honor God and have some faith in God pertaining to their families. And so God saw to it that Moses got the best of training there in Pharaoh's palace, became a military leader. He's powerful in word and deed, Stephen tells us about. And so the, he was in Pharaoh's palace, and no doubt whenever the woman adopted him, passed away, he could have become king of Egypt. She was probably the only daughter of Pharaoh and had no husband. He could have been uh, the king of Egypt. She adopted him as her son. But God had another job for Moses. And we'll find out about that maybe next Sunday. How wonderful do we find the work of God. How wonderful for husband and wife to work together to the glory of God and see God work through their children. How wonderful. Let's all stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that this mother and dad feared God rather than fear man. And they honored thee, our Father, and because of that, one of the greatest leaders that ever walked on this earth came out of that home. His name was Moses. And we thank you for him, Father. We'll see him someday yonder in heaven, the mighty, mighty lawgiver. Now, dear Father, as we give this invitation today, we pray that you speak to hearts in Christ's name. Amen. Now, while Dave is playing, if you're in this building unsaved, backslidden, you want to come back to God, want to join the church, if any reason God's speaking to your heart, you come down here while she plays a couple of stanzas. Obey God. It's better to obey God than man. Obey God. 
God tells you to come forward, you come. You're not saved, you ought to come forward. People are dying every day and dropping off into hell. I think about those poor people killed by those terrorists this past week, yonder in Germany, yonder in Greece, snatched out suddenly. Boy killed out here on a big uh, earth mover, bulldozer, whatnot, out here in Athens the other day, killed instantly. 20 year old boy turned over on him, killed him instantly. You don't know when you're going out into eternity. If you're not right with God, you need to get right. If you need a church home, you need to come forward. Would you come? By the way. We're here to help you. Tony's here to help you. We'll do what we can to help you. 